In the spring of 1902, a woman known as Cassie L. Chadwick embarked on a journey from the smoky streets of Cleveland to the bustling avenues of New York City. She arrived at the Holland House, a beacon of luxury at the corner of 30th Street and 5th Avenue, famed for its opulent banquet room and an extravagant wine cellar valued at $350,000. As she lingered in the lobby, her high-buttoned shoes tapped against the Siena marble floor while she scanned the crowd for a particular face. James Dillon, a lawyer and friend of her husband, standing somewhat aloof. She approached him subtly, brushing his arm as if by chance. When he turned, she feigned surprise, exclaiming what a delightful coincidence it was to encounter him so far from home. She was briefly in the city, she explained, on some private business. Could Mr. Dillon possibly escort her to her father's house? Dillon, obliging as ever, flagged down an open carriage. Cassie directed the driver to 2 East 91st Street at 5th Avenue, the address of a mansion owned by steel magnate Andrew Carnegie. She maintained a lively banter all the way, though Dylan was struck silent upon realizing whose home it was. Cassie excused herself, claiming she would return shortly, and approached the butler with the ease of someone who belonged. Inside, she told the head housekeeper she was considering hiring a former Carnegie maid named Hilda Schmidt, an entirely fabricated individual. Despite her detailed description and confident inquiries, the housekeeper confirmed no such person had ever been employed there. Cassie gracefully accepted the clarification, praised the home's cleanliness, and left with a large brown envelope cleverly concealed under her coat. Once back in the carriage, Dylan ventured to ask who her father was. Cassie placed a finger to her lips, urging secrecy. She claimed to be the illegitimate daughter of Andrew Carnegie. The envelope, she revealed, contained promissory notes for substantial sums and securities amounting to $5 million, all supposedly gifts from her guilt-ridden father. Moreover, she was poised to inherit a fortune upon his death. She implored Dylan to keep her secret knowing well the allure of such a tale would be impossible for him to withhold. Cassie bore no relation to Carnegie, nor had she ever met him, nor was her name Cassie. She was, in fact, the greatest con woman of the Gilded Age. Join us this week as we look at the remarkable life of Elizabeth Bigley, the fake heiress and the greatest con woman of the Gilded Age. Elizabeth Betty Bigley was born in October 1857, the fifth of eight children, and grew up on a small farm in Ontario, Canada. As a girl, Betty lost her hearing in one ear and developed a speech impediment, which conditioned her to speak few words and choose them with care. Her classmates found her peculiar, and she turned inward, sitting in silence by the hour. One sister, Alice, said Betty often seemed to be in a trance, as if she had hypnotized herself, unable to see or hear anything that existed outside of her mind. Coming out of these spells, she seemed disoriented and bewildered, but refused to discuss her thoughts. Sometimes Alice noticed her practicing family members' signatures, scrawling the names over and over again. At the age of 13, Betty devised her first scheme, writing a letter saying an uncle had died and left her a small sum of money. This forged notification of inheritance looked authentic enough to dupe a local bank, which issued checks allowing her to spend the money in advance. The checks were genuine, but the accounts were non-existent. After a few months, she was arrested and warned to never do it again. Instead, in 1879, at the age of 22, Betty launched what would become her trademark scam. She saved up for expensive letterhead, and using the fictitious name and address of a London, Ontario attorney, notified herself that a philanthropist had died and left her an inheritance of $15,000. Next, she needed to announce her good fortune, presenting herself in a manner that would allow her to spend her inheritance. To this end, she had a printer create business cards resembling the calling cards of the social elite. Hers read, Miss Bigley, heiress to 15,000. She came up with a simple plan that capitalized on the lackadaisical business practices of the day. She would enter a shop, choose an expensive item, and then write a check for a sum that exceeded its price. 
Many merchants were willing to give her the cash difference between the cost of the item and the amount of the check. If anyone questioned whether she could afford her purchases, she coolly produced her calling card. It worked every time. Why would a young woman have a card announcing she was an heiress if it weren't true? Betty then headed to Cleveland to live with her sister Alice, who was now married. She promised Alice she didn't want to impose on the newlyweds and would stay only as long as it took to launch herself. While Alice thought her sister was seeking a job at a factory or shop, Betty was roaming the house, taking stock of everything from chairs to cutlery to paintings. She estimated their value and then arranged for a bank loan, using the furnishings as collateral. When Alice's husband discovered the ruse, he kicked Betty out and she moved to another neighborhood in the city where she met one Dr. Wallace S. Springsteen. The doctor was immediately captivated. Although Betty was rather plain, with a tight, unsmiling mouth and a nest of dull brown hair, her eyes had a singular intensity. One newspaper would dub her the Lady of the Hypnotic Eye, and the gentle lisp of her voice seemed to impart a quiet truth to her every word. She and the doctor married before a justice of the peace in December 1883, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer printed a notice of their union. Within days, a number of furious merchants showed up at the couple's home, demanding to be repaid. Dr. Springsteen checked their stories and begrudgingly paid off his wife's debts, fearing that his own credit was on the line. The marriage lasted 12 days. In a life marked by perpetual reinvention, Betty assumed the mantle of Marie Rosa, weaving her way through various boarding houses and refining her craft on the unsuspecting merchants she encountered. Her journey led her to Erie, Pennsylvania, where she conjured a tale of being the niece of Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman. Her act included a dramatic illness, convincing onlookers of her suffering by drawing blood from her gums to simulate a hemorrhage. Moved by her supposed plight, the compassionate citizens of Erie generously offered funds to aid her return to Cleveland. When they later sought repayment, they were met with letters mourning the unfortunate demise of Marie, allegedly just two weeks after her departure. A fiction penned by Betty herself, complete with a heartfelt eulogy to her own alias. As Madame Rosa, Betty claimed clairvoyant powers, entangling herself romantically with two of her clients. The first marriage, a brief union with a Trumbull County farmer, swiftly disintegrated. The second, with businessman C.L. Hoover, proved more consequential, producing a son, Emil, whom she sent to Canada to be raised by her family. Upon Hoover's death in 1888, Betty inherited $50,000, a fortune that facilitated another transformation. She relocated to Toledo, adopting the identity of Madame Lydia de Vere, and continued her clairvoyant escapades. Here, she ensnared Joseph Lamb, a well-regarded local, persuading him to cash forged promissory notes under the pretense of her urgent need for cash, totaling a staggering $40,000. The scheme unraveled, leading to arrests. Lamb was exonerated, viewed as another victim of Lydia's mesmerizing deceit, while Betty faced conviction for forgery and a sentence of nine and a half years. Even behind bars, her persona of a seer did not falter. She foretold misfortune for the warden, a loss of $5,000 and his eventual death from cancer, both of which came to pass. Her manipulation reached the parole board through a series of letters expressing her contrition and a promise to reform, compelling enough that Governor William McKinley, future president, granted her an early release after just three and a half years. Betty's return to Cleveland marked yet another chapter of transformation. She became Cassie L. Hoover, marrying Dr. Leroy S. Chadwick, a wealthy widower and a scion of one of the city's founding families. Her son joined her in the grandeur of the Chadwick Mansion on Euclid Avenue, where she played the role of the doctor's compassionate wife, a facade that concealed her rumored past as a brothel owner and hinted at the lonely doctor having once been her client. Her alleged therapeutic touch for his rheumatic back was all it took for him to succumb to her crafted aura of compassion, sealing their marriage amid the city's elite, who remained oblivious 
to the true depths of her scheming nature. The new Cassie L. Chadwick was eager to impress her prominent neighbors, among them relations of John D. Rockefeller, U.S. Senator Marcus Hanna, and John Hay, who had been one of Abraham Lincoln's private secretaries. She bought everything that struck her fancy and never asked the price. She replaced the doctor's musty drapes and gloomy oil portraits with bright, whimsical pieces, a perpetual motion clock encased in glass, a $9,000 pipe organ, a musical chair that plunked out a tune when someone sat down. She had a chest containing eight trays of diamonds and pearls, inventoried at $98,000, and a $40,000 rope of pearls. She ordered custom-made hats and clothing from New York, sculptures from the Far East, and furniture from Europe. During the Christmas season in 1903, the year after James Dillon told all of Cleveland about her shocking connection to Andrew Carnegie, she bought eight pianos at a time and presented them as gifts to friends. Even when purchasing the smallest toiletries, she insisted on paying top dollar. If a thing didn't cost enough to suit her, one acquaintance reported, she would order it thrown away. When her husband began objecting to her profligacy, she borrowed against her future inheritance. Her financial associates never believed that Mrs. Chadwick would be capable of creating an elaborate paper trail of lies. Her scam involved large sums of money from financial institutions, Ohio Citizens Bank, Cleveland's Wade Park Banking Company, New York's Lincoln National Bank, and smaller sums, though never less than $10,000, from as many as a dozen other banks. She would take out several loans, repaying the first with money from the second, repaying the second with money from the third, and so on. She chose Wade Park Bank as her base of operations, entrusting it with her counterfeit promissory notes from Carnegie. She convinced Charles Beckwith, the president of Citizens National Bank, to grant her a loan of $240,000 plus an additional $100,000 from his personal account. A Pittsburgh steel mogul, likely an acquaintance of Carnegie's, gave her $800,000. Through the prestigious Euclid Avenue Baptist Church, Cassie connected with Herbert Newton, an investment banker in Boston. He was thrilled to provide her with a loan and wrote her a check from his business for $79,000 and a personal check for $25,000, $104,000. He was even more pleased when she signed a promissory note for $109,800 without questioning the outrageous interest. By November 1904, Newton realized that Cassie had no intention of repaying the loans, let alone any interest, and filed suit in federal court in Cleveland. In order to prevent her from moving and hiding her money, the suit requested that Ira Reynolds, secretary and treasurer of Wade Park Banking Company of Cleveland, who himself had lent most of his personal fortune to Cassie, continue to hold the promissory notes from her father. Cassie denied all charges and also the claim of any relationship with Andrew Carnegie. It has been said repeatedly that I had asserted that Andrew Carnegie was my father, she said. I deny that and I deny it absolutely. Charles Beckwith, the bank president, visited her in jail. Although Cassie's frauds had caused his bank to collapse and decimated his personal wealth, he studied her skeptically through the bars of her cell. You've ruined me, he said, but I'm not so sure yet you are a fraud. To this day, the full extent of Cassie's spoils remains unknown. Some historians believe that many victims declined to come forward, but the most commonly cited sum is $633,000 about $16.5 million in today's dollars. In March 1905, Cassie Chadwick was found guilty of conspiracy to defraud a national bank and sentenced to 10 years in the penitentiary. Carnegie himself attended the trial and later had the chance to examine the infamous promissory notes. If anybody had seen this paper and then really believed that I had drawn it up and signed it, I could hardly have been flattered, he said pointing out errors in spelling and punctuation. Why, I have not signed a note in the last 30 years. The whole scandal could have been avoided, he added, if anyone had bothered to ask him. Elizabeth Betty Bigley, a master of metamorphosis, wove her way through the gilded threads of deceit with the artistry of a grand illusionist. 
Born in rural Ontario and marked by early afflictions that shaped her reserved and mysterious demeanor, Betty harnessed these traits to cultivate an air of aristocratic mystery that would serve her well in her lifelong pursuit of ill-gotten wealth. With each new alias, from Marie Rosa to Lydia de Vere and Cassie L. Hoover, she reinvented herself to fit the backdrop of her latest scheme, leaving a trail of forgery, fictitious identities, and mesmerized victims in her wake. Her life, a tapestry of elaborate cons and dramatic reversals, mirrored the very fictions she crafted, ultimately blurring the lines between the woman she truly was and the personas she assumed. Through her relentless ingenuity and the seductive power of her invented narratives, Betty Bigley emerged not just as a figure of infamy, but as a dark legend, etched into the annals of criminal lore as a true architect of deception. I hope you enjoyed this week's story on the greatest con woman of the Gilded Age. Your likes, shares, comments, and subscriptions really matter to such a small channel like mine. So please leave a comment, good or bad, as it means a lot. And as always, thanks for watching.